Hi, my name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and this is a podcast that is one in a series of interviews for the I'm Sweet Enough, the September Sugar Free Challenge. These talks are a way to introduce notice, notice, notable spokespersons in the anti-sugar crusade. I want to explore with each of them the questions, just who are you, what is your message, who is your audience, and what do you hope to achieve in your various ventures and Today, I am interviewing Michael Collins, someone who has devoted his life to helping people free themselves from the obsession to sugar. He, in fact, calls himself the sugar-free man. He is the moderator of a Facebook sugar detox support group, a large group of it's either five or 7,000 people on Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. He's the host and CEO for the annual Quit Sugar Summit, which has uh, hosted like 30 speakers plus. Um, yep. all quite well known in the field of uh, food and food addiction, um, and is the author of Last Resort Sugar Detox Guide. Uh, this is a mouthful. Learn how to eliminate cravings and sugar obsessions by rewriting your eating drive and break free from worldwide sugar cult. And thank you. Thanks for having me. I really yeah. appreciate it. It's an honor. Is, is there anything else that uh, I've given you quite an introduction? Is there something else I've missed? Because uh, I'm sure you do more than just those things. Uh, that's pretty much it. I'm the founder of sugaraddiction.com. I think you already said that. But I think probably my proudest accomplishment in life is that I raised two sugar-free kids from the womb until they were six years old. Wow. And then they only had sugar once a, a month, maybe, at outside birth. They never in the house. Uh -huh. And uh, that, uh, that experiment worked. It's a yeah. long story, but I, I think it, you know, people always said, oh, you deprived them. And they didn't deprive them of anything, and, and they didn't miss it. So Get this, sugar cult. Define what you're meaning. <laughs> Where are you coming from when you say that? Well, I think it's an accidental cult, to be honest with you. I think it's an evolutionary phenomenon that started in, uh, you know, colonial England, and uh, they would leave with empty ships and go to Africa and pick up slaves and go to the Caribbean and and, the, and they created an empire so much bigger than El Chapo ever dreamed of, a worldwide legal cartel that uh, you know, increased us from five pounds to 150 pounds a year from, in 300 years. Mm -hmm. And it just inundated the culture. In other words, look, everything from birth to death is always soaked in sugar. Everyday life is soaked in sugar. It's just insane. And it's just... You know, it, to the point now where, like drinking and driving, like uh, seatbelts in cars, smoking in public places, condoms in bathrooms, these tectonic shifts hmm. uh, that science proved that culturally they could not be sustained any longer is what's happening with the sugar thing. And breaking cults is hard. And changing uh. behaviors is hard. And we are in a tough place because we know what it what it does to the body and the brain and, and scientifically i mean we not, may not be all the way there but we're you know we're we got a good leg up on what scientifically sugar does to the body yet still as you well know people can't no, it's i mean i'm fascinated by how we got here as the only measure of how do we get out right it's like how did society get to this place of one third of the entire population obese, two thirds overweight. So in the United States alone, it's in excess of 200 million people. And everybody knows every diet that's ever been written says at its core, stop the white stuff, right? Uh -huh. Look, people know they, they're better educated than I am on nutrition, except they can't quit. So then we move forward to addiction and no one wants to talk about addiction but now they're starting to at least loosen up to the idea because they've tried for years or decades to quit. Yeah. And now they're, you know, now they're hurt. Yeah. Just tell me what some of the ventures are that you're doing that are contributing to that seismic shift. I'm interested in what you're doing, Mike. Well, you know, I think with the most by accident, I think uh, I started sugaraddiction.com uh, 10 years ago and provided great information, but, Without community, it didn't start working till about three years ago. And I can go backwards, but uh -huh. in that time, I also started the Quit Sugar Summit, which was, you've been on many times, and we have, um, you know, everybody from 
Cornell, Harvard, uh, yeah. every single great educator. I mean, I dig to try and find these folks who've been studying sugar quietly forever uh -huh. and get them on. What I did is I paired them finally in the fourth and fifth years. I finally paired them with the internet folks who really had a reach, meaning mm. bottom line, they had gigantic email lists. And so they were able to blast out to these everyone on their list. And, and, and then if there was five or 10% of the folks on their list that were interested at that point in their life, their health, health list, health folks, JJ Virgin, Drew Canole, you know, people that are, they have, they're just millions of people on their email list. Yeah. And so then those folks started to, you know, grasp the education from Dr. Lustig and yourself and all these other educators. And it started to sink in. And, and it's that kind of, I see myself in, in more, uh, educating the general public and letting, you know, because I do have a background in late stage helping folks in late stage food addiction and, and sugar addiction recovery and addiction in general, I'm a recovering guy, that, you know, I, I got that covered and know how to point them to you and Bitten and, and those types of folks. But I want to help raise the larger awareness, in mm -hmm. other words, and that has to be like the sugar-free man, we have to have memes and cartoons and we have to make it make sense to people in a, a little bit. The hardest part truly of the last decade that I've been doing this, the hardest part is to deliver the message to move them from in the sad American diet into some information and knowledge about it and then move them, if they need it, into uh, recovery from addictive processes. Uh -huh. Well, so many people come to me and they they literally, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. I'm talking sober people do, five years, 10, 20 years in, in sobriety, uh, yeah. in recovery. They didn't know about the sugar stuff. They oh Can you God. imagine? Yeah. Right? And yeah. then the same thing happens with people that have been on every diet thing you've ever thought about but they just didn't put this two and two thing together yeah. and understand that sugar is and, and white powders are uh, hurt or are, are affecting their dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA. And yeah. they, you know, they can white knuckle it for a few days, but they cannot make it a lifestyle. And we kind of, you know, we, we bridge that gap between that knowing the, 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 the diet knowing and the actual possibility that they may have a little bit of an addiction issue. Yeah. Well, I think like anything, it's uh, and it's just a matter of time before we get um, bigger uh, celebrity power. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we recently, I recently interviewed Judy Collins again. We interviewed her three or four years ago. Yeah. And she's, uh, you know, obviously a very well famous uh, folk singer, but she has a book out called Cravings. Yeah. And Cravings is a really uh, interesting book about recovery in general. She was a recovering alcoholic as well. Yeah. So she was really uh, influential. But again, she's for an older crowd. So we need to get like when um, J-Lo and uh, A-Rod were doing their low carb thing or the no carb thing for 10 mm -hmm. days and saying how hard it was. They were all over the, the social media channels. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. Sooner or later, they're all very health conscious. They're, someone's going to latch onto this and, and you know, yeah. Taken under their wings. So. Excited about that. Yeah, the Facebook group is it turned into an inter interesting cultural phenomena as well. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, originally it was uh, uh, for the people who had paid to do our challenge, right? And but because we kept growing, Facebooks uh, used to kept kept throwing us uh, more people, and we had to keep servicing those more people. So we had to get coaches and stuff in there. But ah. honestly, genuinely, what is I think the magic is uh, what a contemporary of ours, uh, Joan Iflin talks about is the mirror neurons. People really, they once they get in there and they find this tribe, they find, and there's a bunch of them, yours and there's bits, everybody, there's you know five or six pretty good sized sugar groups online now and on Facebook. And what I find is <laughs> when someone asks for entrance, I have a little question, you know, you gotta approve them or whatever. It mm -hmm. says they already belong to two or three or four. Mm -hmm. So these are people that are dead serious about getting into all of them. That, you know, mm -hmm. they get into, they shop around, see which one's good for them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great. You know, I think it's like, it takes a village kind of thing to, to, and so, and there is a phenomena going on on Facebook though. They don't like the word addiction and they don't like maladies, diabetes and stuff. So they kind of throttle down 
the amount of traffic that they give us, right? I think personally. Oh, really? But anyway, it's it's a very large success story. I I think that uh, that tribe mentality that look nobody in my family wants to hear about this so they got to go online to get the support and the information and that kind of stuff like i said before the information's everywhere i mean literally everywhere it's got just gta google, <laughs> gts google that shit you know just yeah. google it man it's there yeah, it's but there. The, the the support part is not and that's where the groups come in yeah yeah uh, so you mentioned something about um uh, services uh, what, can you say a little bit more about what you actually do besides just have a support group uh, where people are talking about their food for the day yeah, one of the things that's been the the hu the biggest success we've ever had is a 30-day challenge and mm -hmm. the 30-day challenge that's at sugaraddiction.com or whatever but is that um Every single day for a month, I send you a video between 10 and 20 minutes, right? And what it does is it walks you through, because I've done this hundreds, probably thousands of times, I, exactly what's going to happen on days four, five, six, seven, and eight. You know, within a range, right? they always say, Einstein said, genius is only pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. But it, watching people mm -hmm. detox for uh, hundreds and hundreds of times, yeah. I'm starting to see these patterns. And, you know, you have headaches and, and a lot of stuff in the first two or three days and lethargy yeah. and you're anxious and irritable. Yeah. And then you get to the point where you get like a pink cloud that we talked about. That's, you know, like in the 15th or 20th day and, and people get seduced that, oh, maybe I can have a little. And so right. each day I walk them through that, right? And then they also have other videos, copies, some of the stuff that's on the summit. And I have a a set of core videos, five videos uh, that are um, basically uh, from a real expensive one-on-one -on -one coaching, a couple thousand dollar one-on-one -on -one coaching class. And that gives them even more depth, right? And so by the end of 30 days... So it's a real they, program, a 30-day program. Yeah, it's a 30-day program. They are indoctrinated into a new tribe, and yeah. they run through the tribe together in a separate uh, forum and Facebook group. Mm -hmm. and we have Zoom meetings as well that go with that. So uh, wow. weeknights, we have Zoom meetings, and they see these meetings. One of the things I like about what Joan does is she said about the mirror neurons, people, when they see faces of people, yeah. they start to align with them. And if they're people that are sugar-free, they're going to start to align with sugar-free people. And they stick with them. They'll literally travel through the group 60, 90 days and beyond, and make friends and be able to get text messages and face mess Facebook messaging. And it's, it's just really, like I said, it's the, the education is there. We provide a certain group of, or a certain am amount of education yeah. uh, quite a bit actually, but honestly, I'm creating the vessel, the chalice, the, 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 the thing that people that can hold the group, Right. And that's what the, all that's all about. You know, A tribe. You're joining another cult. That's a terrible way to put it, but it's true. You're joining another group of people. Yeah. And I'll, this happens to people all the time. If they, you know, go to go away to college, right. And maybe no one in their family went to college or they get into a new career. They end up getting a different group of people that they hang out with because they want to learn what that group of people does, you know, uh -huh. but addiction in general is something people think of as the, the, the guy at the brown paper bag under the yeah. bridge. They do right. not, uh, that stigma is still very strong. And yeah. the, the, the idea that you could be addicted to something that is legal to give to a one-year-old baby, mm. that just won't sit, doesn't sit yet well with people. Society is not advanced enough, mm -hmm. except for a small group of people in recovery. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm with it. And it's, uh, it's been my ongoing challenge and one I've taken on. I, I, I think it's, you know, an important one. The background is in addiction. I've been in recovery from alcohol and drug addiction for 35 years. I think that most of the people, I would guess, venture to guess, uh, 90 plus percent of the people who have sugar courses and teach about sugar detox and sugar whatever, are, come from the health field. And they are health coaches and health writers, and they have a diet that they're selling or supplements that they're selling, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. They're giving a lot of awareness to it. Yes. But at the end of the day, we all know that the sugar is and the glucose, that the 
glucose side of the molecule is decimating the body, diabetes, weight gain, a whole thing, inflammation, metabolic syndrome. But what is less known is that the fructose side of the molecule is causing brain chemical reward changes. Yeah. Dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, oxytocin, yeah. the granddaddy of them all, even the adrenals, right, mm -hmm. are being affected by this drug and have been since you were a child. Mm -hmm. And that anyone can white knuckle and quit sugar for a little bit or get healthier or whatever, but eventually, just like all the studies, they're lower. The recidivism rates in the first year of lose all your weight and then gain it all back and then some is yeah. like history it's like the like famous it's very everyone knows it yeah and the reason is addiction the reason is brain chemical reward yeah. manipulation physical manual manipulation of your brain reward chemicals are happening yeah. and no one is talking about this period end of story no one in a broader sense of the diet world the weight loss world is talking mm. about this so they're all talking about health and yeah. reducing sugar so that you lose weight and this and that. And those, um, my guests is, are normies, which we call in our end of the world, you yeah. know what it is, normal people who can take or leave sugar. Yeah. They were athletes. They were never really affected by the use or overuse of sugar. So they just don't understand when someone says, but I keep going back to sugar. They don't, they don't, it doesn't compute with them because that's not been their experience. A lot of the real high level educators yeah. at Harvard, I mean, you know, d different ones are, are not as tuned into addiction parts of it as you would yeah. think, right? Yeah, they got the body stuff down pat. They know what every molecule does to every other thing and everywhere in the body. Yeah. But they're not thinking of the addictive processes. And you know. Now I want to ask you a little bit more personally. You mentioned that you're in recovery. Um, what's your sugar story? My sugar story? Yeah. So I got into uh, recovery in the, in the mid 80s and uh, I read a book called Sugar Blues by uh -huh. William Duffy. Yeah. Sugar Blues was, he ended up marrying, William Duffy ended up marrying Gloria Swanson, third marriage for Gloria Swanson. Uh -huh. And she was, in, the, the reason they met was that he was at a party and from a voice from behind said, he was putting two lumps of sugar in his coffee and she said, I wouldn't have that stuff in my house, let alone my body. Uh -huh. And he turns around, there's Gloria Swanson. Well, anyway, they promoted that book pretty, pretty heavily. It was a very good selling book in the late, uh, in the 80s. I, I mean, they called me the weird addiction specialist in the early days of recovery. They, they're like, Mike, are you sober? You do any drugs? Don't worry about the damn sugar, right? Uh -huh. But meanwhile, they're gaining 20, 30, 50 pounds and getting diabetes and that kind of thing. And so yeah. I just... I went on to have a regular life, a regular career, but I never, I just was off the sugar and the flour and the caffeine. I just didn't use the stuff. And, so uh, right from the get-go, right from your early recovery uh, from the other stuff, you also um, uh, stopped sugar right. as well. But it wasn't easy because I never really went to food groups. I did just kind of audit them, but I, I, I never really went to a food group, a recovery group. What I did was I literally took me like six months to quit caffeine, six months to quit sugar, six months to quit flour, because I kept going back and forth, back and forth. I didn't have anybody to talk to. I did have one guy who was kind of a, a gym guy who somehow, I think he read the book too, and he was off the sugar, so we kind of bonded. Uh, it absolutely is the gateway drug. I didn't realize coming up yeah. the amount of sugar I ate when I looked back at it, you know, before I started drinking, you know, yeah. when I was a kid, right? Because our household was just the sugar house. It was just everything my mother was a, my favorite sugar junkie she loved it she always had a stash and so but i didn't realize it was changing my state then right i didn't realize that i was doing it when i was wanting to talk to girls or when i was nervous or whatever uh -huh. and i knew alcohol changed my state that happened immediately yeah. but when i got off the drugs and alcohol i went right back to the sugar yeah like most recovering people do yeah they go back to the sugar and the caffeine and the nicotine. And they're like, you, you've seen it. I mean, it happens all the time. Yeah. And then you can't stop because it's so socially acceptable, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's been a, again, it's that seismic, that tectonic seismic shift that in an awareness that has to happen of this product that's been enculturated for 300 years. And that's the part that's 
that I like. It's a big, hairy, audacious problem <laughs> that I'm willing. I mean, I, what else am I going to do for the rest of my life? This is cool, man. This is exciting stuff. Uh -huh. See, because I've seen, like you, so many success stories of people that whose lives have been changed, hundreds of pounds lost, diabetes diagnosis going to remission. I'm like, what? What other work is there that you know can make a living and, and do that? So. Well, wow, that's a you know what? That's a great way to end that. But, uh, but so so that might be the end. But I did want to ask you one other question. What happened is I believe and still believe that in dusty church basements. Uh, Food addiction, food addicts recovery anonymous, not OA, and that's we can't even get into that. But the three, four offshoot groups yeah. literally created in like a, an anecdotal cure, right? By weighing and measuring, and you know whatever they, they no flour, no sugar. They yeah. created the cure. Yeah. But what I found great. as I started to do it is that some people had sensitivities to grains, yeah. some people had sensitivities to dairies, to fruit. Um, and one yeah. last one what was the last one but anyway they had these sensitivities that they and then the fake flowers they had sensitivities to those they couldn't use to tempeh and tofu and wheat and all these other things yeah so I have disclaimers under the dairy the grains and the fruit right huh. I have that kind of diet uh, but basically if, you, if dairy grain or fruit starts to bother you or create cravings you got to cut back on it right I don't eliminate right. it but I also don't, I, I, especially fruit and grains, I just don't think it's good in the first 60, 90 days. Yeah. You can always add it back, always yeah. add it back, but you can't, you know, you can't OD on those things or you're going to keep the cravings going. So that's kind of the basic layout of it. In my first 25 years, I was a big fruit eater. I was a big brown rice and grain and you're an oatmeal eater, right? Yeah. And I came to find out that what happened to me was when I quit, I actually talked this, uh, Cynthia Myers Morrison. Yeah. She's a great lady. Yeah. And she talked about it. And we, we and, and so I just, I'm willing to experiment. I quit the fruit and the grains, right? And what happened to me was I had adult acne my entire life. It went away just like that. Wow. I had my teeth, my gums bled all the time wow. from the time I was a kid. That went away like that, right? Wow. My hair was falling out. My <laughs> eyesight, I mean, so many things started oh to cure. So much inflammation started to cure that I had to say to myself, look, this, this has to have something to do with it. Yeah. And that's just me, but, and, and I have that experience with people I coach as well. So that's, that's the short version. Yeah, one of the things that I find in people that have success, which is what they're looking for when they're researching or thinking about this stuff, is that the folks are kind of pioneers in their own world. First one to college, first one to be athletic, first one to do whatever, first one to get married. I don't know. They're, they're a pioneer in their own world, in their own right. And they, have, they share this one kind of trait, which is they don't care what everybody else is doing. They're not, they're not afraid to go against the grain. Because at some level, we are still early adopters. We are, this is not known or well accepted in society. So they are well, uh, they are those, they have that pioneer spirit and that they're willing to, and they're, they're lifelong learners. So if that kind of resonates with anybody, yeah, that's the kind of group that the people that are getting success now. And those are the people we need to work with. That's great. Yeah. Okay. That, that's the vanguard. The vanguard of the uh, sugar crusade, anti-sugar yeah. crusade. Okay, well, Mike, thank you very much for your time. Um, I, I, uh, I'm. Thank you. Well, thank you. I've, this was great. 